Uh, thanks for joining today's uh, GDPR Q&A session. Uh, the session is being recorded and a link to the recording will be sent to you after the session and we'll also upload it to our website. Uh, my name is Penny and I head up service delivery at Workbooks and joining me today is Adrian Ross, who's a risk management professional. He's got years of experience of data protection and data privacy. privacy. Um, and the, the goal of today's session is really to try and help answer some of the questions that you've already submitted. Uh, we've had over 100 questions submitted to today's uh, session, so uh, clearly we're not going to be able to answer all of them, so we've grouped them into themes. Today's session is intended to be interactive and we have a few polls that we will be running throughout the session. You will see these in the chat window, so we'd be very, very much appreciate it if you would uh, respond to the polls. Um, if there is time at the end, we will take further questions. So uh, please use the question panel uh, to submit any questions that you may have at the end. So a quick sort of uh, agenda. Uh, we're going to, going to do a very quick recap on GDPR, GDPR uh, as we've got Adrian here with us today. And then we've grouped, as I said, we've had over 100 questions, so we've grouped them into some sort of main themes, um, which are sort of where to even start uh, for those people that uh, maybe haven't really got going with their GDPR readiness yet. Uh, legal grounds, there are quite a lot of questions about legal grounds and when to use consent and permission and all that sort of thing. Uh, quite a lot of questions about existing data and what to do with it. Uh, then uh, some questions around technical and organisational security measures. And then there were quite, quite a few questions that were specific to the workbooks product, so we'll take those at the end. Um, <clears throat> so a quick poll, I uh, wanted, wanted to know was how ready for uh, GDPR do you feel currently? I'll give you a few minutes to, to answer those questions. The numbers are going up quite quickly. Brilliant. So the, the, the response to that poll is that um, only about 2% of the attendees feel they're ready for GDPR. Um, we've got about uh, four weeks to go, I think, four or five weeks to go. Um, good news is about 62% are saying that they're still working on it, but feel they're ready, uh, they're on track to be ready in time. Um, about 30% are starting to panic. Um, which wouldn't be unusual, and about 5% are saying you've not yet started. So thank you ever so much for uh, responding <clears throat> to that poll, um, and hopefully by the end of it uh, we'll be able to help you feel a little bit more ready than you currently do. So um, as many of you, those of you that are a bit further down the track than others will may have already worked out that GDPR contains 173 recitals and 99 articles, so there's a lot in GDPR. Uh, we've been running a series of webinars on GDPR. Uh, we've done um, three topic-based ones and today's Q&A one. Uh, we've been very much focusing on the practical tools to help you with some of your GDPR compliance obligations. Uh, the main disclaimer really is that we can't make you GDPR compliant, only you can do this. Obviously, some of the answers that we're going to be giving to questions today we don't know your business specifically, so the questions, the answers are going to be generic. Um, so you, it is up to you to make sure that those are relevant to your business as we go through. So I'm going to hand over to Adrian uh, now just to give a sort of quick recap on what GDPR is, um, uh, and hopefully you'll find some of the information interesting. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, let, let's just uh, spend a few minutes talking about what the, the GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation, <clears throat> and I always say that you know GDPR is the first major rewrite of European privacy law in I guess 20 is it 24 years 95 1995 was the last one and of course the big change in all of our lives uh, in the last 24 years has been the internet so this is a uh, uh, the, basically the European Union realigning our privacy laws with the current state of play in Europe. Um, it builds upon the existing Data Protection Act. As I say, we had that, that directive from Europe in 95, and as a consequence of that, we implemented the Data Protection Act in the United Kingdom in 1998. And what the GDPR really does is imposes uh, more obligations on organizations now to protect personal data. And there's some fairly major changes in here. Um, 
there's higher fines for, for non-compliance. And as you can see on the slide there, we talk about you know, going from the current ceiling of £500,000 to potentially 4% of global turnover. And, you know, this is now bringing some, uh, when we look at that in conjunction with the fact that processors are now brought into scope with GDPR, this is bringing some major corporations under the scope of this new regulation. And, you know, I always say, what, what are we, we've got two things going on here. You know, some people say that, you know, privacy laws in Europe is a rights-based system, and, and I would agree with that because on the one hand, we have um, the European Union, you know, strongly aging, encourages organisations to engage in commerce, but at the same time, we've got to balance that off with people's rights. And so, you know, organisations can, can process data, personal data, but at the same time, we have an obligation to protect that data and the individuals who it relates to. So GDPR regulation is slightly different or, or, or quite different from the last piece of European legislation back in 95. That was a directive. And when we get directives, that requires each member state to implement national laws. And way back in from 95 onwards uh, to 98, when we implemented Data Protection Act. So what we have in, in, in real life is 28 different data protection laws across Europe. And this regulation is all about harmonizing or creating a level playing field or more of a level playing field across the European Union, because there are still some areas around the edges. And that would be things like how we deal with crime prevention, national security, all those kind of things uh, that will be slightly different from country to country. Um, and as it says there on that final point, data processors now are now in scope with this regulation. And that brings in organizations like Amazon Web Services, IBM Global Services, and 4% of their turnover would be a significant fine. Okay, so what are the challenges we've got? <clears throat> and, and hopefully we're going to be quite clear about this today is, you know, people think, well, this is just one law that's coming in that we need to comply with and in actual fact you know gdpr uh, around general data protection regulations there are a whole bunch of other laws and regulations that we also have to comply with and one of those is what we call the privacy and electronic communications regulation or more commonly known as pecca and pecca if you like stipulates or lays out the rules how we do direct marketing uh, specifically electronic marketing, emails, uh, text, uh, cookies, all that good stuff. Um, so in terms of uh, con the context for consent and specifically relating to direct marketing, we've got two laws that we need to comply with. That's GDPR and PECA. And, and then, of course, people talk about, well, PECA is going to be replaced by e-privacy regulation. Well, that's correct. And e-privacy regulation, a bit like GDPR, is 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 a complete rewrite or a dusting down of, um, you know, the, the regulations to do with direct marketing. Uh, given that we've now got the internet in our world and the e-privacy regulation, just to be clear on that one, was originally supposed to go live on the 25th of May as well. And the reason it was pulled back was because some of the member states didn't have the resources to do both. And there is, you know, some speculation that the e-privacy regulation is is a bigger, bigger deal than than than, than GDPR. And uh, I think it's too early to say that. The, the, the most recent commentary I'd read that they were talking about January 19, now of e-privacy regulation coming in. But actually, I, I would bet money with probably 12 months from from May. Um, but so that it then raises the question: Well, what do we do in the interim? Well. What we need to do in the interim is move towards a positive opt-in process, and then we'll cover both bases off. Okay. So GDPR comes into force uh, on the 25th of May. Um, now, what that means is that you know the new regulation takes effect, and we've literally had two years to get our house in order. But I, I read some stats the other day that they reckon, and in fact that they, we see that from the polling as well that. A large number of organisations have, have just started and are on their, uh, on their path. I don't know any organisation that can say that it's 100% compliant at the moment, uh, and most organisations are on that path. Um, in terms of Brexit, now there are some implications in terms of Brexit, and those, you know, on one level, 
um, where a control or a processor is outside the European Union, and that would be us in a Brexit scenario, they need to have representatives in the European Union or a rep uh, to cover them. And that would cover organisations at the moment like Slack, uh, Dropbox, all these organisations that you know are embryonic in some way that are sitting outside the European Union, they would need to have a presence in the Union. And then the other thing is, you know, our influence on the European laws going forward, we would not have that same influence as we do being inside the European Union at the moment. So there are implications there. Um, in the UK, we've got this regulator called the Information Commissioner's Office, and we're quite lucky to have one. So, um, <clears throat> obviously, some of the I, I talked about that we've got various themes from the questions that you've asked and also reflected in the poll is that uh, some of the questions were related to really where do I even start um, I didn't realize GDPR applied to us as an organization so you know in terms of, of that Adrian um, what would you suggest that organizations do if they've not yet even got started on GDPR well this slide we've got up at the moment actually is what the the, the the ICO mentioned the, the UK regulator before. They have um, produced this document called the 12 Steps. And this is quite a good framework to follow in terms of GDPR compliance. And, you know, like all of these types of uh, undertakings, it's better if you can start at the top and work your way down. So we need to get awareness on the board and get board commitment because generally we're going to have to allocate resources and that might be money or time. To, to get this project underway. And then secondly, on there it says, what, identify what information we hold. Now this is, there are two areas of GDPR that are quite onerous. I would say that this is the first one and that's establishing what information we've got out there. Get that information into our data inventory. And once we do that, then we can understand the risks that we've got to deal with. Yeah, so as I say, work around this 12 step process, um, but, Data in, con constructing a data inventory is one of the key components to get underway as soon as possible. Thank you, thank you, Adrian. So the, the next uh, sort of uh, theme was all about legal grounds and you know should I be using consent or should I be using leg legitimate interest and all those sort of things. So before we move into that, we'd like to take the opportunity to do a quick poll again on uh, legal grounds. So in terms of the legal ground side of things, so this is really about the legal basis to process data. Uh, how well do you feel you understand the, the, the topic? Results are just building at the moment. And um, as you can see, um, about 65% of, of you feel that you don't really understand the, the topic. Um, which is, I would say, is well reflected from the conversations we've had with organisations so far, and is very much reflected in the in the questions that we receive from everybody. Um, uh, as I said, we had over 100 questions, and a, a, a significant percentage of those were related to legal legal grounds. <clears throat> so uh, Adrian's going to do a, a, a <clears throat> quick recap of legal grounds, um, and then we'll go through some of the questions that people raised. Right, so the best way I think to understand uh, the, the, lawful gr the, the legal grounds for processing is that whenever an organization processes personal data, it has to do so under one of these six. Now, the reality is it might have a, a foot in a number of camps, but we only need one. So we need at least one of those, and if we don't have one of those, then we're not processing data lawfully. So I'll just work through each of these in turn. So the first one you can see there is, where we have consent of the data subject to process the data. Now, <clears throat> some people say that this is the weakest of the lawful basis of processing. And what they mean by that is the challenge that we have as an organization is that the data subject can withdraw their consent under GDPR. And if that's the only basis we've got to process the data, then we're pretty much high and dry. We can't do anything with it. But you know, consent is different under GDPR. And it, under uh, GDPR, you know, we have to offer people genuine choice and control in the matter. So what does that mean in simple terms? Well, any pre-tick boxes go under GDPR. We cannot have pre-tick boxes or the, the one we've all seen before, the negative, where you have to untick to come off some, some list or something like that. So 
we have this thing called positive opt-in. And what that means for us in real terms is that we need to have a look at uh, how the consent that we've got at the moment, and we need to realign that with GDPR going forward. So consent is just one of the legal bases, and depending on what the organization does, it may be a bigger or lesser issue. I would say that in B2C organizations, consent is a much bigger issue than a B2B organization. Yeah. Um, so that, that would be consent. And consent, I, I think I, I read an excellent definition the other day. It's where we're asking permission to do something from the data subject. Yeah. We, they consent to us, to us sending in direct marketing materials. They give us their consent to store their data overseas. Things like that. Yeah. So it's not just tied to direct marketing, as some people think. It can cover a number of different areas. The second one there, performance of a contract. Well, that's another lawful basis to perform. To, to process personal data. And the example I most commonly give there is when we go online to buy a book from Amazon. Yeah, I go and I pick the book off. I might look at the reviews. Then they'll ask me for my credit card details, which of course contains personal data. They'll pass that personal data to our courier company to, to deliver the goods. Well, that's the, the lawful basis that Amazon use to, to process that type of transaction. So a customer buys something, that's the performance of contract, and that's the one that organizations would use there to process personal data. The third one, to comply with legal obligations, well, that's legal obligations on the organization itself. And that's quite straightforward because every year when the finance department sends our salary information off to HMRC, so that HMRC can work out what to tax us in the following year, well, they have to do that because that's a legal obligation on the organization itself. So that's a good example there. And there may be many of those uh, that apply to organizations too. And just like the previous one, performance of a contract, you know, there may be many ways for customers, customers to buy things from us, but the, the lawful basis will probably cover all of those. Um, vital interest is quite straightforward. Whenever the well-being of the data subject is at risk, um, certain organizations can transfer personal data when those vital interests are at risk. Now, a good example would be if I'm on holiday and I collapse in the street, the NHS here or my doctor here would use the vital interest lawful basis to transfer my personal data. And in fact, it would be sensitive personal data because it's medical health data overseas so that I can be treated. That's a good example there. Um, the next one, public interest. Well, if we keep in the in the vein of uh, health, you know, if I've been in Africa and I come back to Heathrow and I get off the plane, I've got a raging fever. Yeah, public interest would be the one that would allow the doctor at Heathrow to say, well, wait a minute, he's been in an area of the world where there is Ebola, is rife, uh, and although I might say, well, let's just you know don't do anything about this, this would enable the doctor to kick off various organisations who might say, well, well, it's in the public interest for us to start notifying you know, various government organizations that we may have an epidemic on our hands. But public interest is also the one that's very much in vogue at the moment because this is the one that's a big focus in the media. When media report stories, like Cliff Richard is the one that's on the, the news at the moment, they use public interest to do that. And then finally, legitimate interest is, is, is kind of the controversial one because in the past, people have said, well, if they remove their consent, we can fall back on legitimate interest. Well, legitimate interest is flexible, but we need to be sure when and when we can't use it. Yeah. The bottom line in all of this, of course, is that under GDPR, organizations have to know which lawful basis they're relying upon at any point in time. Yeah, brilliant. So, um, and obviously, uh, one of the things we've talked about on previous webinars is the fact that you need to store evidence of, of that of those legal grounds and I'll refer you back to the webinars we've run previously uh, where we've talked about how workbooks can help you with that with the, the concept of the compliance record. We're not going to go through that today but just uh, refer you back to those webinars and we will share the links again later. So a few questions Adrian that, we, that have come in and I'll, I'll try and um, uh, pose them as if I was uh, the person asking it. Uh, so uh, one question was, um, uh, what do we do about the contact information we've got for, for employees of a prospect? Right. Well, basically, I was looking at these questions earlier, and I, hopefully I can cover a number of them off at the same time. 
it's for the organization to determine um, what it needs to do in relation to GDPR, in relation to the data that it's collecting in any given situation. And what I mean by that is, for instance, employee data. Yeah. Now, I could go back to an, an organization I worked with previously and say, you know, under GDPR, I have a right to, to, to be forgotten. So I want you to wipe all my employee data off your system. But that organization would come back to me and say, well, actually, Adrian, we have a statutory obligation to retain that data for revenue and customs. Or it might be sales data. You know, they might say, well, we need to keep sales records going by X amount of years in order to satisfy statutory obligations. Now, I might go back to the organization and say, well, understand that, but, you know, uh, that doesn't cover things like background checks, psychometric tests, credit checks, all that kind of good stuff. So really, we need to get down to a data field level, if you like, with our, all the data that organizations hold and work out what basis we can hold that data for. Right. So I'll give you a real good example. I think in our GDPR world, we need to think of data being an asset, which it is within the business when we need to use it, but it can also be a liability. So what I've seen elsewhere is that, you know, I had one organization that kept interview uh, records for people going back eight years and they'd never offered a job to these people. So that data would be a liability in that case because there's no business reason to hold that data and they should really be getting rid of it. That third one down, next of kin. Well, that's that's quite an interesting one because I had a deal, dealings with the ICO most recently on this one. Um, employee joins an organization and then as part of the enrollment process, they get access to benefits. You know, they might put their family or their wife next to kin on, on their HR records to say who would get the benefits. Well, when we do that, yeah, we're not getting that data from that person who is going to benefit ultimately, we're getting it from the employee. And the organization can carry out that process under the lawful basis of legitimate interests. That would be the one that would cover them there. Um, and, and so just interrupt you there, Adrian, that's an example of where doing a legit, legitimate interest impact assessment would be absolutely key because you'd need to weigh up the legitimate interests of the candidate or employee mm -hmm. against the legitimate interests of the uh, next of kin data. And you might decide that the uh, employee's legitimate interests outweighed those of their next of kin because they might not want them to know they were a beneficiary of their life policy. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And these are all the kind of things. And I guess inside that one as well, that third point down there, you know, that would also cover, you know, employers sending employees on things like training courses and training programs, you know, passing that data across to training providers. Yeah, it's in the legitimate interest of the organization to do so. Um, another one that came up was, um, I think there's, there's uh, quite understandably a bit of confusion about who can give the consent or who you get permission, permission from, uh, whether it's from the individual themselves or from the business that they work for. Mm -hmm. uh, and that gets more complicated again when you've got, uh, if you think about you, your, uh, you might have a company director who's a director of multiple businesses um so does he do you need to get consent for each business to hold that person's data or is it the fact that the person has given you their data even though they work for multiple businesses i think the thing with consent is we need to be quite granular in how we go about getting consent and you know if i can give you a sort of consumer example you know what i've seen elsewhere is that you know organizations will ask uh you know, a data subject, you know, can, can I communicate you by, communicate with you by email, by SMS, by various, what we call modes of communication, that would be one way. But when I saw this question earlier, I was starting to think that, you know, on one level, we talk about privacy notices in GDPR. And, you know, we have privacy notices on our website for customers, but also we should have privacy notices for employees. And for employees, we should tell them, you know, as part of the joining process, how we're going to deal with their personal data. And that would be one way of the organization capturing, you know, the consent for all the, the employee data in one hit, if yeah. you like. And therefore, they could pass that employee information across without getting the consent on a one on one basis. Yeah. Um, and then um, a question, several questions came in about 
when should we get permission so if if somebody calls if if i was to call you and say adrian i'm interested in um some advice on gdpr mm -hmm. um and what would be the price for that at what point should you be asking me for uh, or telling me what legal grounds you're processing my data on well you should be telling me up front what you're going to be doing with my data and you should if you need to get my consent for doing something you need to get consent before you actually do something um one something i came across most recently was um you know uh, an organization that wanted employees to uh to to sign up to a travel system which made perfect sense because the organization was going quite quickly and then as soon as you got into you know setting up your personal data on this travel system i think it was the second page it said started talking about something called privacy shield well privacy shield is a mechanism that we use to store data in the usa or give people in the usa access to data um, we should be telling people about that kind of thing up front, yeah. And of course, the thing the thing in in our internet world is we need to remember that, you know, like things like web forms, webinars, seminars, all these kind of things, we're capturing personal data all the time. So we should be telling people at the outset what we're going to do with the data, and if we need to get the consent, get the consent before we do it. So if uh, just to take an example, a lot of businesses um, will have. Um, when you call the business number, there's typically a um, an announcement saying, you know, press one for sales or press two for support or whatever. And it may also include the fact that you record inbound calls. Uh, should you amend your uh, phone system to also include a, a disclaimer about the privacy um, or how you process data and the fact that if they want to understand that, they should go to your website and look at your privacy policy? Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that. In fact, something uh, just to extend that, um, I'm working with one organization at the moment and what they're looking at quite carefully is business cards. And what they're thinking about doing is on the reverse of the business card is effectively having a privacy notice that says, if you want to know more about how we deal with your person, the personal data that you're giving us, because a business card is personal data too, um, go to this website and you can get a full explanation about what we do with your personal data. And I think that's that is a good way of it going, you know, quite practical way of dealing with these things. So the uh, uh, taking that a, a step further, if you like, is that um, an awful lot of the questions that we've had have all been about sort of, do I have the right to send them emails and all this sort of thing? But actually what we're saying is GDPR is really, really wide and it's not just about the electronic communications, it's about making sure that you've looked at every method at which you gather data or process data and making sure that the the individual understands what you're going to do with that data as you say whether it's by phone uh, hard copy email web and so on uh, you should be making sure that privacy notices is, is very prominent yes indeed and in fact um, i'm glad you raised that because people tend to always forget about paper-based records mm -hmm. and there's still a lot of paper-based capture going on out there yeah, yeah, particularly financial services. Yeah. So um, we are going to go on to, to recap a little bit about consent under GDPR and consent under PECA. Uh, we did spend a lot of time in the in the part three of our webinar series on this topic. So we're just going to recap it very quickly here because this was really um, uh, one of the questions here is about do I need opt-in consent on web forms if we're using legitimate interest? Well, what I think you need to do, <clears throat> right, so let's just, let's just talk, uh, just bottom out consent for a little bit. The reason that consent is a big issue under GDPR is because it's been abused over the last 25 years, if you like. And we've all been there, we've all gone onto Facebook or something like Facebook, and then suddenly we find our data's being shared all around the world, but we never consented and the reason that cons we didn't consent is because it was buried down in terms and conditions so in the gdpr world we need to get consent up on the front page and let people know what they're consenting to as i said earlier pre-tick boxes are out now and i would say consent in the gdpr world is a box to tick with some very clear words around what it is we're giving our permission for yeah that's what consent looks like under the gdpr world and coming back to consent versus legitimate interest there there are you know there will be situations where consent is the right lawful basis and issues where or situations where legitimate interest is the right lawful basis but we need to know and we need to make that evaluation and we need to make it very clear on in our private privacy policy and that should be very 
very much very visible on our web sign up forms so that people can go and look at it for more information if they need to yeah yeah absolutely okay so uh, as i said we were uh, just just to uh, um uh, a lot of people are confused about uh, consent whether you know, consent under gdpr and consent under pecca yeah um uh, so we just thought it'd be helpful just to recap this as i said we did we did spend a whole webinar on this topic topic recently so we're not going to spend too much time on it just now okay okay right the issue <clears throat> at the moment is and i'm seeing this elsewhere with the client is you know that we haven't been really good at capturing consent in the past and this is now causing us issues because if you think we've got a consent database there and in that database there will be one section of the database of people who said do not market to me ever under any circumstances and then what some organizations have tried to do under and to, to get aligned with gdpr is, is written to these people and say we need your consent for gdpr and there are a couple of those organizations quite well known ones who've been fined quite heavily because no means no in in the consent world and then along that continuum we've got people who've you know uh not given not ticked a box yeah or consent has been assumed and those people have been in a dialogue over the number of years but consent has not been very clear so what we need to get towards is positive uh, opt-in consent under gdpr so we need to realign consent um going forward now there's also this thing under pecca because called something called a soft opt-in now how soft opt-in works is that if somebody has bought something from us or has got a quotation from us to buy something that allows us to market to them uh, under picker rules quite legitimately to the individual concerned we can do that that's what's called soft opt-in but all of con all of the consent mechanisms and consent is quite broad because there's something called implied consent there's third party consent and that's where we buy in lists and all that good stuff the whole consent thing is now under the spotlight once again so we need to be very careful when we use consent and, and what basis we're using it for so the, the, the summary of that and i think the way we summarized it last time was that um consent under pecca and consent under gdpr are very different uh gdpr consent is the um uh, to, to be able to have the data at all you need legal grounds mm -hmm. um which may or may not include consent in the gdpr definition uh, but you um and then there's consent under pecca which with BT, b2c you have needed consent to market to b2c uh, for a very long time uh, gdpr isn't changing that um uh, but that you might need might think about doing uh consent from a pecca perspective i.e opt-ins um under gdpr because of e-privacy coming in the future for yeah, B2B. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a couple of things there. Um, and the the other thing that's going on in the market, and I think this is quite useful to understand, is that organizations, and our financial services is a good example of this, where they have used consent in the past, are now making a reevaluation and saying, well, wait a minute, now, under GDPR, we've got to keep records of when we got consent, they can withdraw consent, we've got to keep records of that also. Um, so uh, in financial services, they are starting to look at things, well, actually, this is too much bother. Can we do it with under legitimate interest or can we do it under contractual obligations or is there another lawful basis that makes more sense to use? And that's exactly where we need to be. Yeah, brilliant. So uh, as I said, we, this, this was quite a big topic because there were a lot of questions on it. So we have to spend a little bit more time on it than perhaps the other topics. Um, and uh, what we want to do is just do a quick poll and see whether the 10 minutes you've had with Adrian has actually helped or, or, or made you more confused. So another quick poll on um, how do you feel now? Has the session that we've just done helped at all on um, uh, legal grounds? So that's good, about 70% of you think it's helped and about 30% are still somewhat unclear. Um, uh, I'm with you. Um, <laughs> it, it is a complex topic and it does take a lot of time to get your head around. Um, my, my recommendation in terms of next steps for those that are still somewhat unclear is to go back to um, the webinars that we've run. Um, we've done this, we've done, as I said, we've done three of these uh, and at each one we've talked about legal grounds 
uh, and also the ICO website are very helpful for legal grounds. So moving on. Moving on. <clears throat> actually, just thought if I may just jump in there, Penny, there's actually a very good paper on the ICO website. It's titled uh, Draft Consent Guidance for Consultation, but actually it's not draft anymore. And it's a real good paper for organisations to download and just have a look at how consent should work under GDPR. Great uh, paper. And perhaps we'll, we'll send that link as a, as a follow up. So uh, moving on, uh, the other sort of area um, that uh, we had a lot of questions on was really about uh, what do I do with my existing data? Um, I've, got a, I've got lots and lots of data. How do I make sure it's compliant from a GDPR perspective? Um, can I still have it? Um, and all those sort of questions. So we'll spend a little bit of time on that. Um, so again, just a very quick poll on data management. Um, in terms of your existing data, and you might have 100 records, you might have 100,000 records, you might have several million records. Uh, do you know? Do you feel you know what to do with your existing data from a GDPR perspective? So about 82% saying they don't know what to do, um, and we've got less than five weeks to go. So uh, hopefully we'll help you a little bit with that today. Uh, but it, yeah, it is a big topic because we've, uh, as organisations over the last uh, however many years, we've been very data hungry. Um, and obviously we haven't always had good grounds to hold that data. We've squirreled away lots and lots of data and we've been uh, very protective about keeping it and not necessarily having the grounds to do it. So let's try and help you with this. Um, so Adrian, one that came up an awful lot is, and it's related to the, the legal grounds topic that we've just been going through is, do we need to get consent from all our existing contacts or can we infer it, I think is that question. Um, I think what we need to do there is get everyone towards a positive opt-in model. And we need to go back and look at, what did we get consent for? That would be my first question. Is it direct marketing or is it, you know, under the uh, the basis of employment where we're giving consent to, you know, pass to the company doctor to start looking at our records? Um, a good one, I think, here is the uh, the realignment of consent within employment. Right now, let me try and give you an example. There is that we've all gone through the employee or the employment life cycle where we've we've gone for to an organization, we've been interviewed, they've made a job offer, they sent out the pack with all the details, and we turn up on the first day, and then suddenly we get asked for our bank details. Yeah. Now employers have been saying um, that you know they are getting that additional personal data, because bank details is personal data. Uh, on the basis of consent, what the ICO is saying, well, that's not proper consent under GDPR because they don't have a choice. You know, we could say, I want to be paid in cash, in which case the employer would probably say, well, the job's not there, right? So th that's another example. So we need to re-examine these and how we engage on, on consent. Yeah. Um, but, you know, coming back to how long we retain data, we need to know, we need to get our data inventory. And I, that's key because I would say, in my experience, organizations always have more data than they think they've got. So that's a key step, identify what data they've got, and then look at each data set and say, what would be the retention period for that particular type of data? I mentioned uh, uh, HR data earlier. Well, typically six years would be the, the period to hold that. Um, but a good example would be, just say we interview people and we don't offer them a job, well, actually, we should hold that data for 90 days, or at least 90 days, maybe probably six months. And the reason for that is not just GDPR, but also uh, employment law, because if somebody's going to raise a claim for discrimination and discrimination starts at uh, interview stage, they have to do it within 90 days. So that's why we keep you know, CVs for 90 days when we don't give people a job, probably six months in case we want to do give them a job and they're a good candidate. Yeah. So that's the kind of level that we need to go to. Yeah. So another um, uh, an area was, um, can we mass mail um, all our existing data to get consent? And there's been some interesting uh, stories in the press lately about organisations that have tried to do that and fallen flat foul of existing uh, PECA laws. Yeah. What we've not been very good at with the consent data is is holding it in, in a format that enables us to do some decent analysis on it. Uh, so the, the basic rule here is that if, an, if somebody has said to you, do not 
do not uh, market to me under any circumstances. We can't. We can't go back to them and say, look, can we get consent to go forward? Um, but if if we have a, an ongoing relationship with someone at the moment, there are certain things we can do up until the 25th of May. Um, and we need to really sort of what's encouraged under the new regime is putting consent back into their control. So we give them things like preferences, yeah, where they can sign up and they can say, yeah, I consent to going forward and I consent to being, you know, uh, marketed by uh, SMS or email or whatever it is. Yeah, so we, we need to do an analysis on that. And sometimes that's not that straightforward. I've got one client at the moment where they've got people who've said do, definitely do not do it. And those are the ones, the companies that have been fined, as Penny has just said. And then they've got, they've got, uh, they haven't got pre-take boxes, but they've got boxes that are blank. <laughs> so whatever that means. Um, and, and also they've got ongoing, ongoing relationships. Yeah, uh, people may have purchased you know, so we can send those groups certain things also, but we need to just look at that again. So just sort of going back to what we were saying before about the legal grounds, we don't necessarily need to mass mail them to get consent, but we do need to mass mail them to tell them what legal grounds we are using to process their data. And if the legal ground is consent, then we do need to reaffirm consent. Yes, indeed. Yeah. And, and Adrian, sort of lastly on this, uh, if I'm using legal grounds, as the cons uh, sorry, I'm using consent as the legal grounds for processing that data, what happens if I don't get consent by the 25th of May? Well, strictly speaking, under GDPR, you don't, if that's the only lawful basis you have, you then don't have a lawful basis to, pro, a lawful basis to process that data. That's the bottom line on it. Um, now, I should also qualify this in a sense that, you know, uh, GDPR is what, what, in GDPR we talk about a risk-based approach. And, you know, we've got finite resources and we might say, well, actually, we don't have the resources to realign consent. And an organization might say, well, actually, I'm going all things considered, I might process going forward. Um, what well, one organization that springs to mind is Wetherspoons. They got rid of 650,000 emails because they could not say that they got that personal data uh, validly under consent. So they decided to wipe that data and start again get the right consent processes in place and then start all over again. Yeah. So that is an option. Right. So just, um, just this is the recap from the um, part three webinar we did a few weeks ago. Um, so the, the pretty important considerations that we recapped at that point was making sure you've got the lawful basis under GDPR to process it. Um, to, so that is to even have the data in any form at all. And then the second part of it is, do I have the right to market them? So that's your marketing practices. And this is where I think people have got very confused between consent on GDPR and consent in, in PECA. And it might have been more helpful if they'd called it permission and consent or something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So just in terms of, um, I'm just going to uh, briefly talk about um, the sort of processes that you've been talking about in terms of managing compliance and existing data. We've talked very much about um, the need for a data inventory, so identifying the data that you have, doing the audit and mapping of that, so the personal data you've got, where did it come from, how are you processing it, who you share it with, and when should it expire, so the retention period you're talking about. That then defines your data processing policy, so from that you can group their data into different groups, <coughs> define the lawful basis for each group and its retention period. Uh, obviously, uh, to clean it all up, um, and in workbooks terms, we'd create the appropriate compliance records and delete any data we no longer need. Um, I'll talk a bit about inform in a minute. And then, um, as we said, if you haven't got, if you're using consent as the lawful basis for processing data, if on the May, on the May 26th, if you haven't got that consent, you really should delete the data. So um, on the inform side of things, um, I, hopefully the, the sort of summary of what Adrian's just been talking about is that the need to inform um, your data subjects depends upon the legal grounds. If you're using consent as the lawful basis, you probably would be best to email them and ask for them to reaffirm that consent because your current consent is probably not lawful. Um, and if you're using other legal grounds like uh, legitimate interest or contractual obligation, you, you could just send them a, an email with a link to your updated privacy notice. Uh, but most importantly, uh, if you're sending these emails out, don't forget, if you're B2B, exclude any existing opt-outs that you've got. And if you're B2C, only include your existing opt-ins. And, uh, and obviously, don't forget to include your links to your preference center. Make sure that's granular. 
and your unsubscribes. Uh, I think Honda and uh, was it Flybe? Flybe, Flybe yeah. got fined recently quite significantly for sending out emails trying to get consent, uh, but they emailed people who had already unsubscribed. Yeah, so basically they were asking for consent without having consent to send the email in the first place. Yeah. yeah. So just uh, say, I hope that um, uh, the um, what we've just talked about has helped to clarify the, uh, the situation around with your existing data. A quick poll around uh, data management and whether this session has helped at all. So uh, bear in mind that about 70% of you said you didn't really feel you knew what to do with your existing data. Do you, do you feel from this last five or six minutes you spent with us that you have a better idea of, of that? Well, that's good because we've taken 70% no to a 58% yes, so that's really very good. Um, and obviously some of you are still somewhat unclear. Uh, what I would suggest, and we'll send the links out, is that we covered this in part one of our webinar series. Um, so we'll send you that, and I'd suggest that spending 40 minutes to listen to that webinar might be a, a useful um, uh, way of spending some time, um, because we've gone into the details much more than we've done on this, um, we, than we've got time for now. I'm very conscious of time, and, and we're, we're, we're up to the 10 to, 10, 10 to 11 mark. We will keep going, because I know there's still a lot of questions to go, and there's been quite a lot of questions that have come in. Um, so, in terms of technical and organisational security measures, um, we had questions, um, uh, and quite a few questions, Adrian, about um, we've, we've, we've still got an old database from a, a migration, a system migration we did some time ago. Mm -hmm. um, I still want to be able to get access to that personal data on that old database. What can I do? Um, I think this is kind of similar in concept to, you know, what we see um, you know, when we talk about developing new systems, then we have test systems, and then to to populate the test system with, with personal data, we take a copy of the live system, and the same controls don't get applied to the test system as they would to live because we think it's it's okay and all that good stuff. I mean, the bottom line here with, with databases, anywhere there's personal data, um, we need to have the right technical controls in place. Now, technical, the GDPR talks a lot about technical and organizational measures. Technical measures are things like encryption, you know, the good old-fashioned technical controls, access control, and includes things like physical access to buildings, all that good stuff. Yeah, so we would need to just, if it's got personal data in it, it needs to be protected. That's the bottom line. Yeah. Um, and then what about if we've uh, had a supplier who previously managed our database for us, yeah. and we've asked them to decommission it, but for some reason they don't, and they have a data, data breach. As the data controller, are we still liable if they have a data breach? Yes, yes. There's an obligation there on the controller um, to ensure. In fact, you know, this this whole controller process relationship is redefined under GDPR, and there is something called joint and several liability. So they can both be sued, or they can be sued independently. So there's an obligation on the controller to make sure that that data has been deleted, and you would probably do that by doing an audit. On them. So um, you'd actually ask to go and inspect yeah. their systems to make sure that database has been removed? Yes, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and sort of similar vein, um, if we're subcontracting a third party to process personal data, what records do, do we as a controller need to keep? Um, well, the, the principal thing that we need in place between a controller and processor is a contract, because what's happened in the past is you know, quite a lot of situations that this is has been going on on an ad hoc basis. And in the GDPR, there is some guidance what that contract should look like. Um, but we have shared responsibility between those two organizations. Um, and in terms of records, you know, the controller would determine what, what, information was being, what information was being collected. They would then stipulate on the processor things like, you know, what, how, what the processing looked like, how often it took place, what happened to the data at the end, did it get deleted, et cetera, et cetera. That would be the kind of level of detail we would go to. Brilliant, thank you. And then um, uh, an example about, for example, in the right, if somebody exercises their right to be forgotten and they successfully exercise that right, yep. um, obviously some of their data may be on backups and there's quite a lot of concern about 
if you edit a backup, do you then uh, that, that backup? Well, a, a, it may not be technically possible to edit the backup, and B, uh, if you did, you're effectively corrupting your backup. Yes, this is this is a practical challenge in all of this. Um, in the you know, I guess sort of the last thirty years or so, we haven't really thought about backups as being. Um, something that we needed to bother about too much, but under the GDPR world, we do need to. And I, th I think I saw something the other day where somebody, uh, what they had on the backup was images, yeah, and it's not easy to edit out an image from a collection of images, as I understood it. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I think this area will be subject to further clarification. I think the fact that it's beyond use, you know, counts in our favour at the moment. Strict interpretation of the law means. Deletion from a live system also means deletion from backup. So I think we'll get further guidance on this one from the regulator. Yeah. Because uh, this, this is an issue going back decades now. Yeah. And uh, this is no different, actually, from the data, current existing data protection law anyway. Mm -hmm. And on the ICO website, um, we can perhaps send a link around or put it on our uh, GDPR uh, information centre. Uh, there is a quite a good one for the Data Protection Act around putting data beyond reasonable use. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll send that round. Uh, another one is about really about the visibility of information. So one question was, if, we have, if we've got a system calendar where we've got everybody's annual leave, yep. and we're also recording their sickness, uh, the, their absence, is that okay that all employees can view that somebody's off sick? I would say you need to make a, an evaluation on a case by case basis. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, there, there, there is a part of the GDPR that says people should only have access to the data that they require to do their job. Yeah. Now, I, at the same time, I would say calendar, holidays calendar is quite open. But, you know, there are certain parts of the European Union where, and I think in Norway in particular, where employees can go and look at other employees' earnings, how much tax they've paid. You know, that's quite common in Norway. And that's the kind of things we need to be aware of, too. So, you know, I'd, I'd take it on a case by case basis and, and I certainly put yourself in the shoes of the data subject. Would you want your sickness data to be you know, visible to the whole company? Probably not. OK. And then another question. Um, so, for example, if I've got an employee uh, who's located in, say, in India, so mm -hmm. they're employed by that our business, but they have access to the our EU system, EU based systems. Yep. Are there any restrictions around what I can allow them to see or do with that data, bearing in mind they're not inside the EU? Um, well, there's a couple of things here. That particular scenario you you just described would constitute what we call an international data transfer, right? So if somebody's in another country looking at data that's back here, that contributes constitutes a transfer as much as if we transferred the data by you know, transmission over to that other country. That's an international data transfer. So we need to have certain contracts in place. But also the GDPR uh, goes down to the level that says that the person that's viewing data over here, we should have the same level of uh, background checks in place to make sure they're, you know, observing laws of confidence. Law of confidence is something that sits alongside GDPR, so we need to remember that too. Now, what does that mean in real terms? It means if we're going to background check someone if they were here and looking at data, then we should background check them if they're over there. Right. So those are the kind of things we need to consider. And so there'll be need to be some specific clauses in their employment contract related to the... The, the, the data we're viewing. Yeah. Yes, okay. exactly. Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks, Adrian. So um, we just thought there's a few workbook specific questions which I'm going to try and run through very quickly. Um, so one of the questions was, can we set up a preference centre and allow data subjects to update their details? If you're use, if you're a Gator Mail customer of ours or want to move to Gator Mail, we can set up a preference centre for you. Um, that is professional services work, and that preference centre can be set up to um, have an update my details link on it, which then maps their update back into workbooks to the personal or lead record. Um, the next one was about can you store evidence of compliance on the compliance record, for example, the re relevant email or screenshot, or could you even create compliance records from an external system? Uh, yet the answer to all of that is yes. Uh, we've got the ability uh, to have related items to a compliance record, um, and you can also access it from the via the API, so you can create compliance records from your other systems. Um, has web to lead been updated to capture consent and compliance? That's all in the next release, so look out for the release notes on that one. 
Uh, another question was around what technical measures are available to secure login access to workbooks. Um, some of you uh, will be aware of this, some may not be, it was in the last lot of release notes. Uh, there is something called login protection where we are um, checking the uh, certain information when you log in and if it doesn't match, so for example your IP address and things like that, to where you've logged in before, you will get a, an email to um, re-verify your access. So that is something that uh, as a customer you can turn on if it's not already switched on. Another question was about protection against brute force attacks. So how many failed login attempts? It's quite complex, but if you start, uh, if, if, if you uh, start, if you have somebody who's trying to uh, log into workbooks as you, and they don't know your password, we will lock them out gradually. Um, uh, so there's, I can give you more details on that if you want, but uh, it would take you a very long time. Um, and then the last one was, are updated workbook service terms available? Uh, yes, an email went out to all support contacts this week um, with the updated link to the updated service terms. Um, so if you haven't had that email and you are a support contact, let us know and we'll resend it. Um, but on workbooks.com forward slash legal, that has got our new MSA, uh, data protection policy, security policy, uh, sub processes policy, all sorts of policies. Um, so just to kind of try and help you move forward. Um, uh, we've got a G Workbooks GTPR Center on our website where we've got links to lots of resources, blogs, forums and so on, as well as links to the webinars that we've been running, all the recordings. So anything we find that we think will be useful to you, we'll put up there. Um, so uh, we'll send that link out as well. So opportunity for a quick last poll um, in terms of, you know, based on the, the hour that you've spent with us, how confident do you now feel about uh, GTPR? Uh, and has this uh, Q&A session been a good use of your time? We'd really appreciate your input into that. Good, more than half of you, are, um, uh, 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 just about more than half of you think it's been a good use of your time. I'm very conscious that everyone's giving up an hour of their time today and we're all busy trying to get ready for GDPR. Um, obviously, those of you that are still somewhat un unclear about GDPR, I would recommend that uh, you use the ICO website. Um, you, uh, that we've tried to share as many resources as we can from a practical point of view uh, in the three webinars we've already done. Um, I'm very conscious of time and we have had a few questions, uh, but it is now 11, so I'm afraid we will perhaps tackle those uh, independently. Thanks very much for your time. Adrian, thank you very much thank for giving you. up some of your time this morning. Thank you.